Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Scott. Uh, my mentor is Nico. Uh, I'm from the Purdue University. I'm a PhD student. Uh, my talk is on mirror optimizations. I work on the Rust compiler. Uh, so this is the get pumped up slide. So uh, I'm going to tell you these things and feel free to cheer whenever you're ready. Uh, do you want faster programs? Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. want? <laughs> do you want longer battery life? Hell yeah. Yeah. This is the last one. Do you want more free memory? Yay. Yeah. We want all these things. And how are we going to get them? We're going to get them through compiler optimizations. OK, so uh, I need to do some background before I jump into what I did uh, this summer. But it's going to be pretty brief and high level, so I'll go fast, uh, just so that we're all on the same page. So we start from the Rust source, uh, which Cameron talked about Rust in his previous presentation. Uh, basically, it's a, a high level systems programming language. And uh, the compiler doesn't just compile Rust line by line into machine code. It goes through intermediate steps. Uh, it compiles the Rust source to high level intermediate representation to LLVM intermediate representation and then to machine code. Uh, and this is pretty much how most uh, compilers work of high level languages. You don't want to go from source to machine code in one step. Uh, so what did we do recently? Actually today the Rust team uh, flipped the switch and now MIR is part of uh, the Rust compiler. And MIR stands for Middle Intermediate Representation. And it's coincidentally the same name of a spaceship. That's the spaceship. So what did we do? There's now a tiny spaceship in the compiler. And it's between the high level and LVM IR. Um, so why would we do this? Uh, what's, what's MIR good for? Uh, basically, it's the simple core of Rust. Um, it gets a, it makes things explicit that were not explicit in Rust code because you wouldn't want the programmer to type these things out always. Like uh, types of uh, variables can be uh, elided in certain cases in Rust, and uh, the mirror makes them all explicitly stated. Uh, it also has simplified control flow. So in Rust, there's a few different ways of doing loops. There's lots of different kinds of expressions for control flow. And uh, the mirror changes that all into a sort of mostly go-to based uh, control flow graph. And uh, panics and drops are explicit in mirror. So a, a panic is sort of like when something goes wrong in the code and, and we should like abort the program. And drops are sort of like, this variable is no longer used. We can reclaim its memory. And the mirror is rather than like representing the syntax and the characters of the code, it's representing things in a control flow graph that you can follow this graph of how the code is going to flow and the data is going to flow in the program logically. And the real reason for mirror, or for my purposes at least, it's easier to write optimizations in a middle intermediate representation than on the source language. So that's why, uh, why I use it for my project. So let's, I'll show you an example uh, that gives you an idea of an optimization a compiler might do. Um, so the top box is some theoretical uh, Rust code, and it defines a kind of silly function. But the bottom would be is sort of like the mirror generated for that code. And in, in mirror and in, in Rust, uh, addition is checked for integer overflow. So if you add two numbers that are too big and can't be held in the representation of the integer that you're adding, it'll uh, give you an error, uh, and it'll detect that. So the plus signs in the Rust code are translated into checked ads in the mirror. And this is the bottom uh, generated code is one way that you could do it, but there's not only one mapping, right? There's, there's other ways that you could, you could define this, this same function. And so to jump to the conclusion, you can actually optimize this code. Uh, we already had the value of C available to us, which is actually the same value as A plus B. So you could do checked ads C plus C, and you get rid of a whole checked ad. And we saved one optimization, or one instruction. And so our code got a little bit faster, and it took a little bit less uh, energy to execute. And also, we potentially saved uh, stack allocation uh, for the temporary variables, so we saved some memory, too. So that's like what we want to do as compiler optimization writers. So we did it. Yay. Uh, now, that was an example of an optimization. Uh, I'm going to talk more concretely about the things that I really did. 
uh, in my internship. Uh, so I worked on generating a mirror for switch arms. I worked on some generic uh, graph algorithms that are useful in a lot of different compiler optimizations. I worked on a test framework for testing these optimizations, and I'll talk about one optimization I did called move up propagation. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about all those things a little bit more in depth, uh, but not super, super in depth. Uh, I'll have links at the end for all the details. So efficient switch arm generation. So uh, Rust has this construct expression called match, and it allows you to check the type of a certain variable. And so in this example, we're trying to see if x is a, a tuple of a, a, b, b, all the way through z, z. And the way uh, the compiler used to generate the code for this was a little bit uh, suboptimal. So the first step would be like you want to, if you're going to check both, maybe you check the first one first. So you check if x dot zero, the first field of or the first component of x is a, and that's what b b zero is on the right. So then, once we've gone to bb0, we need to generate code init. And we say, OK, if x is really a, I need to check now for the other field of this tuple if it's really a2. And that's what bb1 is. And so before, uh, it would generate a, a basic block like by bb1, bb number stands for basic block number, or whatever. whatever. Uh, before, it would generate different basic blocks for each of the else's in this bb1. So you can see it says if bb1 is if x1 is b, but we already know that the pattern for b is not satisfied because we got to this block by finding that x0 is a. So we sort of have more information. We don't need to test all the variants individually. And so now, the rather than generating the basic block on the left, the compiler generates something like the basic block on the right, which sort of says, I already knew that I matched one of, all the other candidates are dead if I matched a for the first field. Uh, so I don't need to generate different basic blocks. So it's sort of like fanned out before, and now it just go jumps directly to sort of like an otherwise block. Uh, now I'll talk about some of the graph algorithms. So my mentor, Nico, had a graph algorithm library that he had implemented, and I sort of uh, ported it over to use the compiler's internal data structures. And this is just showing a common example of a graph algorithm that you want in a compiler uh, for dominators. Basically, uh, a, do a basic block dominates another basic block if uh, the, the control flow will have to go through uh, this other block. It's, it's just a general uh, piece of information you want to know about code that you're optimizing in a, a lot of different compiler contexts. So now uh, I was working on these optimizations, and I thought, how do we know that they're right? And one way is to just like assume that I'm really smart, or whoever is writing the optimization is super smart, and it's just going to do the right thing. And I was like, well, maybe that's not the best idea. I don't really trust myself. So we decided to do some uh, testing framework for uh, mirror optimizations. And the cool thing about contributing to Rust is that it's all in the open. So you can just send in your pull request, and it'll merge your pull request if it can, and run the whole uh, continuous integration testing suite against the, your pull request and see if it's actually going to pass all the tests. And if it does pass all the tests, then that gives the maintainers or the internal team, like pretty good confidence that your code is at least sort of okay. So we want to extend this to optimizations too, and say, you know, give you a way of testing your optimization so that when some stranger on the internet comes and says, "I have the great idea for this optimization," you can say, "Okay, write a test that's sort of like makes us believe that it's reasonably good." And uh, it's a really cool aspect of contributing to Rust and open source in general that uh, you can get your pull requests in and see if they really work on the real code base right away. Uh, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is move up propagation, which is a optimization that I implemented. Uh, this is going to both hopefully eliminate temporary variables, which will save us memory, and uh, eliminate some copying. So the, the general idea is sort of like you have a temporary variable, temp0, and you assign something to it, any expression. And then you don't use temporary 0 ever, and you assign it to some other variable. So really, you never needed this temporary. You could have just assigned directly to the destination variable first. And this seems pretty straightforward when you just have a few statements. But the hard part is sort of like figuring out when this optimization is really safe. So like maybe if dest is a pointer dereference, then if the pointer changes, then you're writing to a different uh, variable or a different memory location by moving the right to dest. So that's one of the things that is still going to be ongoing work is uh, figuring out what the precondition is to have this optimization fire. Right now, it's it's really uh, conservative. 
and only does it when we know that this optimization is really safe. And there's some other, the thing about optimizations in compilers too is that they sort of like build up. Like the optimizations feed into each other and they have sort of like a feedback loop. The better optimizations you have, it actually strengthens your other optimizations. So uh, we'll, I'm working right now on deaggregation, de which uh, breaks a struct into parts instead of assigning to the whole struct in one big chunk. And so that uh, gives you the opportunity to optimize the temporaries that are the fields of the struct and more complex expressions uh, that are assigned to dust. So this is my call to action slide. If you feel inspired by my talk, well, maybe not, but maybe you just like Rust in spite of my mediocre talk, you should go to these websites and you can get involved. You can go on IRC. Uh, you can submit a pull request against uh, the, you can fork uh, Rustling slash Rust and then submit your pull request and the, the Travis will test the whole thing and tell you if it works or not. Uh, discussion is on internals Rustling. That's a pretty cool place to hang out and discuss things about Rust and then my contact information is there. Uh, Thank you, everyone at Mozilla. Uh, it's been awesome. And I'll do questions. OK.